Don't miss out. Get your free copy of Dr. Guido Holzman's How Inflation Destroys Civilization. Visit Mises.org slash HAPod free and we'll send you the book. This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Simon, welcome to the Human Action Podcast. Thanks for having me. So folks, I was explaining to Simon before we started recording here, this is going to be a bit unusual, and he has gracefully (laughs) given me permission to do this. I think he needs to sit there for a minute and just listen to me talk. Uh, to explain the context of this particular episode of the Human Action Podcast, because this one, unlike most of the other ones, is not really a standalone. This is largely a response to the Dave Smith episode that we had recently, where I had Dave come on, and the, the context of that was Dave Smith was literally trending on Twitter, and it was about his immigration views, and he was just getting embroiled in all kinds of arguments. And so I thought, you know what, this is a big topic, obviously, both in terms of you know the American political discourse, but also within the ranks of libertarians. So I had Dave come on this show, and I'll link, of course, folks in the show notes page to that episode if you missed it. And I had Dave lay out his current thinking on immigration policy from a libertarian perspective. Uh, and I'll and I'll very, very quickly summarize that in a minute, but just to get to the context of what we're doing here. And then there was some pushback. So a lot of people loved it who agreed with him. Some people criticized him vehemently, but what came up in the disagreements, a lot of it I thought was just rehashing the same terrain that you know Dave had covered in the discussion. But one critique or objection that intrigued me was someone said, Bob, you're missing the point that what Dave is doing there and echoing you know, the Hoppe, Kinsella stance on this and, and the later Rothbard, that Rothbard's views changed on the, on the topic – um, you're overlooking the fact that there's a crucial link in their argument or, or piece of their argument that assumes some that public property, so-called public property, property that the state claims to be in control of and you know own in that sense, that they assume that it's the rightful property of the taxpayers or the public at large or something like that, and then they everything else follows from that. But actually, you should go read. I was told, Simon. Uh, Gunzel has a paper in the journal Libertarian Papers that disputes that. And so you, need, you know, that's the, the strongest objection to what Dave Smith said on your show, Bob. And so if you want to be fair and balanced and present both sides, which is what I do want to do here, you know, you should have Simon come on and, and talk about that point. So that's what we're doing here. One last bit. I am going to, I think, just like I was trying to be devil's advocate with Dave, so here too with you, Simon, I want everyone to really understand what your argument is. So I'll ask clarifying questions, but then at the tail end of this episode, we'll do a lightning round and I'll, you know, try to throw stuff at you to, to see, you know, to put, put your views to the wind tunnel. And I can just predict right now, I know folks what's going to happen. People are going to say I'm harder on Simon than I was on Dave, but partly it's because I've had longer to think about this one. And so I try to come up with entertaining zingers, but um, be that as may. So I, I do last thing I'll have the disclaimer I, I'm not being coy. I'm truly not trying to take a stand on this because I really do understand where both sides are coming from. For an analogy, it's like if people say, should there be prayer allowed in public schools or should, should public school teachers be able to post the Ten Commandments? And there's no good answer to that. Like, I understand where both sides are coming from on that. And the only real solution is you should privatize everything. And so likewise here, we all in this debate, you know, Dave Smith, Simon, me, Hoppe, Rothbard, uh, the other people that are on the other side of the, for all and caps, we all, you know, Brian Kaplan, we all agree the perfect solution is privatize every bit of real estate and let the owners set whatever policy they want. And now we're just arguing about, okay, but in the real world next Thursday, what, if anything, should this government's policy be vis-a-vis the border and people crossing it? Okay. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. So I'll stop there. And then Simon, like I say, if you want to Exp, you know, explain where you're coming from and the, the origin of this paper that's the so, sort of the focus of our talk. And I know you jotted some notes down too about the Dave Smith episode and maybe, you know, bring up things. So I'll largely let you kind of take this where you want in terms of giving the other side. And like I said, folks, I am going to play the role of 
But I think Dave Smith would say, duh, 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 particularly if I think he would have good, a good answer, but this should not be construed as me saying I agree with Dave and disagree with Simon. It's more I want the viewers to get a, a fair hearing of both perspectives. Okay, so with that long-winded introduction, Simon, take it away. Well, thanks, Bob. Uh, just in terms of the history of how I came to write the paper, a number of years ago, I had uh, been re reading up on the Hop Kinsella versus Block debate on immigration, and uh, I ended up, I, I, it occurred to me that there was a, a big assumption people were making, as you noted, about who owns the, uh, who owns public property. So I ended up emailing Walter, and we had some exchanges back and forward, and uh, in the end, he said to me, you know what, you should take these arguments and, and put them in an academic paper. And he introduced me to uh, Matt McCaffrey, who is the editor of Libertarian Papers, and, and that's how this article came about. Uh, and then, as you said, you know, so I, I've, I've had this position. It's really the paper deals with two aspects. Number one, that um, the... the I don't know what to call them. Let's call them these libertarians. It's libertarians who advocate for state management of borders while there's a state. It doesn't exactly you know, run off the tongue easily, so maybe we'll just call them these libertarians. But these libertarians say that, number one, it is the libertarian position that taxpayers own public property uh, and therefore the, the second position is sort of who should, how should that property be managed by the state and it's that the state should manage the property on behalf of taxpayers, as trustee for taxpayers, as a private owner would manage it, et cetera. Um, and so my paper did take on the ownership part as well as the management part. Um, there's actually a lot more to the management part as well, which is that some of the notes I jotted to you after the, the Dave Smith episode. So the way I would sort of approach this topic is in three broad buckets. One is sort of what I would regard as the, the libertarian legal principles on property ownership. Um, then I would say that deals with the, the ownership point mainly. And I think there are some common understandings among libertarians or guiding principles that I think uh, refute the, the management theory that, that these libertarians- So, so Simon, just so I'm, I'm jotting notes here and so the listener get it. What are the three buckets? And then I guess you'll go through them each in turn. Yeah, so that's what I was saying. There's there's okay. the there's the legal principles of libertarianism in terms of mm -hmm. acquiring property. There's more so broader libertarian uh, ethos or guiding principles which deals with the management uh, of public property. And then there's some purported justifications that these libertarians give for their position. That so I'd like to uh, address all three of those. Okay. Um, so you know the. Let's start with the ownership of public property, um, and, and it really hasn't been developed anywhere in the literature as far as I can tell. Uh, before we get to that, I, I do distinguish between two types of public property, uh, state-seized land and state-claimed land. Uh, state-seized land is land that was owned by a private owner and the state seized it. Mm -hmm. And often that's eminent domain, but it could be criminal or civil asset forfeiture. Okay. Uh, state claim land, on the other hand, is land that was never owned by anybody and the state just claims, in, in effect, the state wouldn't put it this way, but the state claims to have homesteaded. it. Um, and, and I think the differences can be important when looking at the, uh, the contention that taxpayers own public property. Um, and I'll get to that. But just to, I, I'll assume the viewers are conversant in why we have property rights principles and the non-aggression principle. Um, yeah, 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 probably for the purposes of this, we, okay. yeah, we shouldn't reiterate right. that. So, you know, w when you look at libertarian legal principles of how property can be acquired, there are really three heads. One is voluntary transfer that the um, existing owner uh, intends to convey title to the transferee. Um, the second one is peaceful homesteading, so unowned land where someone comes along uh, using peaceful means and, and marks out the property as theirs. Uh, and the third limb, which isn't always discussed, but Stefan Kinsella has done some good work on this, is what I would call restitution actions, because in libertarianism, while it's not legitimate to initiate force, 
uh, if someone initiates force against you, you are entitled to use force in response. And in the moment, that would be self-defence, but subsequently it could be that you get a judgment against them and, then, and, and then you go to enforce that judgment and as part of that restitution, you can actually seize their property and that would not be initiation of force, it's more reactionary mm-hmm. force. So, so can I stop you, Simon? So like, would an example yeah. of that last one be something like somebody stole your car and then, you know, was joyriding and totally ruined it and it just it drove it off a cliff, you know, he, like uh, in the James Dean movie or whatever, and it's just wrecked, but he has a car in his driveway and so maybe the libertarian judge would say, well, you're allowed to take that guy's car and so that would be an example of how you could acquire just ownership not through homesteading and not through buying it from the original owner? Correct. Okay. Yeah. And I should just, one nuance, voluntary transfer doesn't have to be buying. It could be a gift or a bequest. Sure, sure. The, right. Okay. The point is the intention of the transfer. Or, so if you run public property through those three filters, I think you end up in a different place from the prevailing assumptions. So first of all, with state seized land, um, I think – most people would agree that it belongs to the prior owner. Um, and, and I will say that when Hop and Kinsella discuss public property, sometimes they do drop language to that effect, but not all the time, not consistently. But I, I don't think, I think if pushed, they would agree that, um, state sees land belongs to the prior owner. So, it, so we can certainly say with respect to that land, it's not owned by taxpayers. Maybe it's owned by one taxpayer and an identifiable taxpayer. Um, for state okay, just, just to stop you, Simon, and make sure so the, the, the listeners are getting this. So you're saying we think not just you and you know Walter Block or somebody like that, but even you think uh, Kinsella and presumably Dave Smith probably as well would agree if the local government, you know, for eminent domain purposes, some guy clearly owns this house and they just come along and seize it and give him a, a way below market value. So there you go, and now it's that. The, the position would not be, oh, well, that house belongs to all the taxpayers. It's, no, the, the state took it from that guy and really it should return it to him. Correct. Okay. Uh, and, and if you were to apply the, the, these libertarians' management theory, the state should actually manage it on his behalf according to his wishes. So right. uh, we'll, we'll get to that in the management theory. But So then let's still with state claimed land. Um, so first of all, the voluntary transfer doesn't help you out because the land was unowned. There's no prior owner to voluntarily transfer it to the taxpayers. Um, I don't think the homesteading limb helps either because taxpayers certainly haven't homesteaded it. They've done nothing on the land. And I would argue the state hasn't validly homesteaded either because it's used violence to acquire the means to seize control of that land or claim control of that land. So, no one, I would argue, of the two relevant parties, neither has homesteaded uh, state claimed land. Uh, and then the third, uh, the restitution limb, I don't think applies either because although taxpayers may have a cause of action against the state or the individuals of the state for stealing their income in the form of taxes, uh, you know, your remedy is to go against the legitimate property of the aggressor. Well, since the state doesn't legitimately own uh, state claimed land that you can't the taxpayers couldn't go against that land uh, as a remedy for for the aggression levied by the state so when as I say when you when you run state claim land through those three filters I think the conclusion is that it's not owned by taxpayers it's certainly not owned by the state it actually remains unowned and can, can the, I stop you for a second yeah. Simon so uh just to make sure, so here I'm not trying to like blow you up. I, I just want to clarify because I, I totally get what you're saying, but it seems to me there's an an interesting scenario that you're uh, stepping over here that could arguably be, be quite relevant. So what happens if the government taxes the taxpayers against their will, you know, so has a bunch of money, and then it goes to a clearly legitimate owner of some land and gives the owner the money and the owner voluntarily sells the government the land in exchange for the money. No, that, that's a very good point. I, I think because the, the question is often 
or I've seen asked, can the state ever own property legitimately? Mm. And I think the answer is the state can own property from a voluntary transfer, but it can't from homesteading. So, um, and the reason I say that is voluntary transfers, the key criterion is the intention of the transferor. So if someone intended to convey title of the land to the state, I think that's valid. I mean, they could do it as a gift without receiving any compensation or, 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 or they could receive compensation, but the state can never homestead land because it's not using peaceful means. So there, you know, to the extent that you're right, to the extent there is land that has been voluntarily transferred by uh, the prior legitimate owner of the state, the state could own that. The problem I have with, with that is in practice, because we're talking about what is a voluntary transfer, and if the, if the government comes to you and says, "Hey, I want I want I want to, I want to buy your land," you know, the question is, is there the implication of pressure or duress or threats of eminent domain, etc.? So, but but I but I do I do agree in theory, if mm. that's not present, that there could be some land that. L- l- is, let me. Can I ask one a different one? But can I? So the okay, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, just, just to finish that thought. Yeah. To the extent that is the case, then the state would legitimately own the land, not the taxpayers. Okay. What, um, like like the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in the United States, the SPR, the government maintains stockpiles of crude oil, you know, buried in salt caverns and stuff. So am I, am I correct in saying you're not claiming that those barrels of crude oil in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve are virgin, unowned, assets waiting to be homesteaded. Okay, so let me let me answer that with two points. One is we ha- we need to assume that it was voluntarily acquired. The state didn't pass a regulation saying that all oil, you know, for every every mm-hmm. every barrel of oil, you know, 10% has to go into the reserves. Okay, sure. so so we have to we have to assume that. Uh, the other point I would note is to the extent the state does legitimately acquire property through a voluntary transfer it's actually a you could you could look at it as a temporary or unstable ownership because now that the state owns property, if taxpayers were to sue the state for return of their stolen income, uh, and the state couldn't or didn't return it, then yes, the taxpayers could go against that property. So the state could own property in that respect, but it would be it could be temporary. Oh, okay. All right. So okay, go ahead. Right. So. Um, so leaving leaving that that particular aspect to the side for a second, I think the the other interesting part about um, state claimed land is, you know, in the in the case of state seized land, uh, it's I think everyone would agree that the prior owner owns it. But in the case of state seized land, the state has also stolen the income of taxpayers to create the means to seize the land. So they, it's, 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 there's the same wrong that's been committed in the, as in the case of state claim land. But in the case of state seas land, I don't see anyone saying, well, therefore the taxpayers also have an interest in the state seas land, right? So, mm-hmm. but if they don't have an interest in the state seas land, then why would they have it in the case of state claim land? Because it's the same wrong and, and you'd be looking at the same remedy. Um, so can I, can I ask you, like, so let me make sure I, just to distinguish it. So let's say there's a, a local, you know, crime gang and they come and they steal a thousand dollars from a business owner. You know, maybe they say, it'd be a shame if something happened to your place here. If you gave us a thousand dollars, we can make sure that nothing bad happens. And, you know, everyone understands what's going on. The guy gives them a thousand dollars. And then if they go and spend the money, I don't know, buying a jewelry for their girlfriend, um, and it's and there was no coercion. We'll stipulate in the jewelry sale. Mm-hmm. Um, are you saying the original business owner has no claim on the the jewelry? No, I'm saying that the mafia would uh, the mafioso would would own that jewelry because the seller of the jewelry intended to transfer title to the right. mafia, mafioso. Um, but if the uh, business owner who'd been extorted were to sue the mafioso, um, because that property is the mafioso's, the business owner could actually claim the jewellery, uh, or, or I mean, he could sue for his money back or or for the jewellery. But in either case, um, uh, I think you know again. That's why I say the ownership of the mafioso would be temporary at, at 
in most cases. Okay, right. And then just one more tweak. So now suppose he he leaned on the first guy as before, you know, get, got the thousand dollars of cash. He's walking. He goes into the jeweler and does the same thing and says, "Oh wow, that's a beautiful necklace. My broad would like that." Uh, just as a sign of your goodwill and the fact that we're doing such a good job in the neighborhood, can I have that and give it? You wouldn't want to disappoint my girlfriend. And the guy says, oh, no, Mr. Soprano, here. Go ahead, it's a gift from us. But everyone knows what happened. And so now he walks out. And so he has both $1,000 and the uh, jewelry. So I'm comfortable saying clearly the first guy that lost the 1000 even if the, the guy goes, the mafioso goes and gambles it away, the money, the cash, I can see why the first guy, even a libertarian judge, would not would not award the first guy the jewelry as compensation because he'd say, well, no, that was stolen too. Whereas if it had been legitimately purchased, then I could see the judge ruling. Strictly speaking, the best thing would be to give you $1,000 in cash, but since he doesn't have it, but he's got that jewelry, he'll give him that instead. Are you okay with at least the broad features of what I just said? I am. Okay. Um, and then just to finish up on this legal part, there's there's actually support um, it, when Rothbard in Ethics of Liberty talks about um, land titles related to oil concessions and when he talks about frontier settlements, he makes I, he makes some explicit statements about the fact that regardless of what the government claims, regardless of government claim to own the land or be able to control it, it's actually open for homesteading uh, by by others. So there, there's that support in in Rothbard in a different context. And then similarly, Hopper actually, I think, contradicts his own position on immigration when he's writing about desocialization in East Germany. Mm -hmm. um, because remember, in, on immigration, Ho uh, Hopper is saying that the taxpayers uh, own public property. But when it comes to desocialization, he is quite explicit that when you're dividing, uh, privatizing land or profit, any property in, in as a socialist economy becomes market oriented, he says that it will be immoral and inefficient for everybody in the country to get a, a share of that property. In fact, he's in favor of what he calls syndicalism, where the users of the property would be the homesteaders. So if there were a state owned factory that was being um, destatized, the workers, the factory workers would own it. But the reason I think that's a contradictory to his position on immigration is it seems to me in socialism that the tax, you're being taxed 100%, right? Mm. You, you, you don't keep any of the fruits of your labor. You can't even query whether you can even use your body as you see fit. So I look at the population in a socialist economy as being taxed at the rate of 100%, whereas in a market-oriented economy, maybe it's 30 to 40%. Uh, and so I don't see why it seems like when Hopper is saying in the case of immigration, the taxpayers own that property, but in the case of desocialization, the taxpayers don't, the users do. So th there's a bit of a contradiction there uh, in, in, in his writings in, in different contexts, I agree. Okay, let me just, Simon, I'll, I'll read it because I, I know exactly from your paper, I'll read the quote. So I agree with you, Simon, without seeing more of the context uh, and folks, obviously, I encourage you to go read Simon's paper to see the exact details and judge for yourself. Y you're right. You have some quotes from Rothbard about, like, if a multinational oil company comes into some underdeveloped country and starts drilling for oil, that they, like, they're homesteading it, you know, as opposed. And it's, it, it, that does seem hard to, like, it, I get why Rothbard thinks the local, you know, government run by a bunch of thugs isn't the rightful owner, but on the other hand, it's not obvious why he's calling that unowned because, you know, didn't the local government steal that from the people who lived there all along, not, you know, the multinational oil company coming in. So I get, Simon, why you think there's a tension with Rothbard's views on that and then at least the later Rothbard's views on immigration. But the Hoppe thing, let me just read I, I, I don't think there's a contradiction here and we can, you know, I'll, I'll read it and just let you push back if you want, but let me just say what I think Hoppe is getting at. So he says, this is Hoppe, folks in Simon's paper. More specifically, all original property titles should be immediately recognized regardless of whether they are pres presently held by East or West Germans. So he's talking about the fall of, you know, the Berlin Wall and everything. And how do we, how do we privatize coming back from communism? Insofar as the claims of original private owners or their heirs clash with those of the current asset users, the former should in principle override the latter. Regarding governmentally controlled resources that are not reclaimed in this way, 
syndicalist ideas should be implemented. Assets should become owned immediately by those who use them. The farmland by the farmers, the factories by the workers, the streets by the street workers, the schools by the teachers, the bureaus by the bureaucrats, and he's got in parentheses, insofar as they're not subject to criminal prosecution, and so on, dot, dot, dot. Moreover, our syndicalist proposal is economically more efficient than the only conceivable privatization alternative in line with the basic requirement of justice. Um... According to the latter alternative, the entire population would receive equal shares in all the country's assets not reclaimed by an original expropriated owner. Aside from the questionable moral quality of this policy, it would be extremely inefficient. Okay, so that's the quote. So I think what he's getting at there is to say, yes, if if somebody could prove definitively that, yeah, the, the Soviets or the East German government or whatever took my grandpa's house 30 years ago, then clearly it should be given back, you know, to the heir. But absent something, like if there's just some car factory that was built, you know, by the comrades, collectivized labor and everything over the years, and now there have been East Germans going in and out of this car factory, cranking out cars, well, who should get it? Hop is saying, well, the, the people who've been working there day in and day out, they, they should get it, not just the East Germans as a collective because there's lots of people in East Germany who had nothing to do with that particular car factory. And so absent some direct demonstrable claim like it was seized from, you know, somebody originally when the communists took over, it should go to the people who are the most tied to it. And he's saying he thinks that would be more moral, but clearly more efficient than just kind of saying, oh, every East German gets a per capita share and all the different industries and farmland, everything going on. He thinks, no, let the, who knows best how to manage the farms right now on day one of the revolution? Well, the people who've been working the farms all along. So that, I think that's what he's saying. To me, that doesn't seem contradictory, but Simon, go ahead and if you think that, do you disagree with, with my interpretation? I, I do. Uh, I, I mean, let's leave aside the, the, the state seized land. I think there's no disagreement there. If, if you mm -hmm. can show it was your grandfather's property, then it is yours. But I think he, when he's talking about land besides that, where there are no uh, historical claims, uh, again, I, I think... I think the whole population are taxpayers in a socialist economy. Um, they're just being taxed at a higher rate than in a market-oriented mm -hmm. economy. So that's why I think he's saying taxpayers in a market-oriented economy own state claim land, but taxpayers in a desocializing economy don't own state claim land. Instead, the users do. I mean, I don't know if that means the Customs and Border Patrol officers would own, <laughs> would own the state claim land or, you know, in the U.S. or whatever, but mm -hmm. it just seems like his, 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 Overlooking the fact that the general population are taxpayers in a socialist economy. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, I I understand the point. I, I get, well, just one last thing, just to clarify. I th I think you know I haven't talked with Hoppe on this topic per, per se, but my guess is he would say something to you like, "Well, yeah, if it's a money using capitalist market, you know, interventionist but market economy, typically what the government does is it broadly taxes people and then." quote, voluntarily, you know, with its stolen funds, enters the voluntary marketplace and, you know, builds a factory. You know, if, if people are working in a, quote, socialized car factory in the United States or whatever, they're not slaves. It's not slave labor. They're being paid market wages to, you know, bid them away from other private sector uses. And so I think that's why he's thinking the taxpayers are more just the owners per se, whereas in a truly communist society, then it's like who own, who actually built the car factory? Well, it's not the broad public because they were taxed. It's more like, no, the people who actually at gunpoint were ordered, go build that thing and you go in there and make cars, comrade, and that's your part in the in the cog. I mean, you could so argue- I, that, I think that's where he's, where he's coming from. Yeah, you, no, no, maybe, I, yeah. I agree that's where he's coming from. I mean, you could argue mm. the taxpayers in a market or an economy did nothing to, to deserve ownership of the land either. Um, they just had their income stolen. I mean, Rothbard does say that slavery is, is a 100% tax. And, and so that was what got me thinking that, that socialism is 100% tax. So anyway. Oh, okay. But one, just, so just so you understand the sign where I'm coming from, that's why I stopped you earlier to clarify. So I, we would have to see empirically with some of these things historically, where, how did the state come to claim ownership? Yes. But I think that's why I was going through the whole thing about the mafioso. If we did it. So I think the idea is, if a lot of what the current government property is was actually because it raised general funds through taxation or you know running the printing press and then went out and purchased most of it voluntarily you know given that it was using stolen money 
then that's different from if, yeah, they steal a bunch of taxpayer money and they also go around grabbing stuff, you know, through ex- just literal like, expropriation of the assets. I, I would agree. I mean, I agree there is that third category. I think it's mm. probably less relevant to the border uh, and the land near the border, but but it, it could could well exist. And I also think, okay. also says, I think you're, there's a, there's a heavy inquiry into whether it was really a voluntary transfer, but yes, I, I think in theory. Okay, okay, yeah. So I think we're fairly close on the basic theory, and now it's a lot of this is going to turn into, okay, in practice, what does all this theory mean vis-a-vis the immigration question? Right, so, so let's, okay. turn, let's turn to that, because the, the, the implication from these libertarians is because the taxpayers own public property, Uh, and we have a state, or while we have a state, then the state should manage that property. Again, there are different formulations on behalf of taxpayers, as trustee for taxpayers, or Mm -hmm. as a private owner would manage it. And I actually think I've got like sort of five reasons why I think that advocating for that is really contrary to um, common libertarian positions in in other areas. So the first, so just so I'm mapping this, like if we're if we're judging a debate here, are you still are you now in the second bucket? Yes. And these are five points within bucket yes. number two. Okay. Yes, I'm dealing with the the problems I have with the whole management theory about how the state managing public okay. property. So, the first one is that as libertarians, you know, our end goal is the elimination of this. Oh, as ANCAP libertarians, our end goal is the limita- uh, elimination of the state, and we should all be advocating for fewer state violations and less state power, not more violations and more state power. Um, and with immigration comes a massive immigration state, right? So you've got armed officers running around, they board Greyhound buses to check papers, they raid employers' mm-hmm. businesses. Um, the courts have defined the border as including 100 miles inland, which basically I think probably touches every state in the U.S., um, and so, you know, you've got funding and bureaucracy. So it seems weird for libertarians to be advocating um, that uh, that position. And, and in fact, they're, what they'd be advocating is an enlarged immigration police state. Um, and, and note that the, the immigration police state doesn't just have implications for immigrants. It also, I think, violates the rights of citizens because... Mm-hmm. It, it, it prevents citizens from freely employing immigrants, uh, renting to immigrants, having personal relationships with immigrants. So, um, you know, and I think when, in, you know, Rothbard, when he was writing in For a New Liberty on destatization, he was saying that the me- our message should always be consistent with our principles, that basically you should only advocate things that, that are on the path towards your end point um, and not, not deviate from that path. Um, I guess the, the other the other point I would make in this respect is, uh, you know, Jacob Hornberger uh, writes a lot on on immigration and the libertarian position, and he makes the point that libertarians should always be for abolition, not reform, uh, mm-hmm. and which is there's a bit of an irony because Hornberger is not actually an ANCAP, but um, he um, you know he gives the example of you know think about slavery. I mean. I've seen statistics that, you know, in the antebellum period, maybe only one to two percent of the population were actually abolitionists. And can you imagine um, if the abolitionists, instead of pounding the table for abolition, were saying, "Look, slavery is cruel, uh, so let's let's reform it. Instead of thirty lashes a day for wrongdoing, just ten lashes a day." Well, sure, that'd be much better for the slaves. But would we ever have gotten to abolition of slavery if there weren't a group? pounding the table for it. Um, and Hornberger often says, you know, we have conservatives to argue for reform. If libertarians want to add something to the debate, they should be uh, steadfast uh, 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 you know, arguing for abolition. So I think these libertarians are actually asking for reform of the immigration police state, just a different policy. So mm. that's why, you know, for all those reasons, I think, I think it's, I would call it unlibertarian to argue for an enhanced immigration police state. Okay, so maybe just on that one, and again, folks, I my point here is not to tackle Simon, like, but just to give him the obvious to what to me is the obvious pushback that I think Dave or you know somebody in his shoes would would give in this point. So I think 
Dave could rightly say to you, Simon, oh, right, my, you know, the, the analog from, I am an abolitionist. I don't want there to be government agents searching buses and, and putting up fences. My goal is, my ultimate goal is complete abolition of the state. That's the ideal. Um, and, you know, private property for everybody, that's the goal. And I will say that, and if I could vote for that tomorrow, I would vote for that. And again, but that's not what's going to happen. And so now we're all just arguing over the second best alternative. And for people claiming to be open borders libertarians, I don't know if you use that phrase, Simon, but they're not merely saying, hey, the government should just get out of this altogether. Like, for example, a lot of people are saying, um, and like Chris Freeman was one of them that I pinned him down on Twitter about this. He, he thinks the federal government shouldn't merely say we have nothing to do with immigration, but no, if they see agents of the Texas uh, government or whatever, National Guard under there, putting up a fence, then the agents of the federal government should go down and tear the fence down. So it's not merely, hey, let's just get out of this and do nothing. It's actively intervening. So it's using the powers of the government to implement open borders. As a you know, so anyway, I, whether I guess I'll let you respond to that. Right. So the second best alternative, I agree. I mean, I was going to deal with this later under the justifications, but I'll deal with it now. Um, yes, they're, they're, you know, these libertarians would say we don't want a state, but while we have a state, the second best alternative is to have the state managing the border. Um, but I, I feel like that's distracting. As a libertarian, that's distracting from the core wrong here, which is state power. I mean, play that out. Yeah, let's take the invasion of Iraq. So, mm -hmm. you know, these libertarians, to be consistent, would say, sure, the U.S. government should not have invaded Iraq. But, you know, while it's there and controlling Baghdad, it should definitely be able to set a policy of shooting males between aging, you know, 18 to 35 if they violate the 6 p.m. curfew because a private property owner would take steps to uh, repel or, you know, shoot dangerous trespassers if, we're going, if they were going to threaten the people on the property that the private property owner cares about. So, or, or you could take the education system. You could say, sure, we don't want the state involved in education, but while we have a state, this is the curriculum they should put in place. So again, I, I don't, I'm not disputing that they are abolitionists in a sense, but their message is, is, not, is not, you know, hack away and get rid of the immigration police state. It's, it's reform it and it's, and it's do things that, that it's a message that I don't think is is in accordance with with libertarian you know principles. Okay, so in here just because this is so relevant, let me push back on this one. Um, but again, Simon, I, I do want to give you plenty of time to make your position. But on this one, I'm pretty sure Dave, because I've heard him deal with it. So I think Dave would say, and again, folks here, Dave thinks he's just you know. Uh, recapitulating what he learned, you know, because his, his view was changed. Dave used to be an open borders kind of guy saying, this is just an arbitrary line on a map. I don't want agents of the state telling people what they can do. And then he's come around. So his point, Simon, is to say, yes, in terms of second best or whatever, and not introducing more aggression into the equation, under no circumstances would the policy be that the government is allowed to initiate new aggression on people. But where he's coming from is to say, there is no, it's it's not the case that somebody from Denmark or from Guatemala has a, a, a libertarian right to walk into the current landmass of the United States. Whereas, like you said, in the case of somebody, you know, some kid in Baghdad, if U.S. troops go over there and just shoot him in the head, well, then they clearly have violated, you know, that, that his body was his. Whereas it's not the case that if somebody stops somebody from entering into Texas just, you know, a priori without more information that, that, that they're violating his rights. You don't have a right to just walk around wherever you want, whereas you do own your body as the default position. So I think that's how he would distinguish that. And then you said the thing about the schools, and I think Dave would say, yeah, that's not a reductio ad absurdum. You're right. I do think if the schools are going to just start teaching Satanism and transgender stuff or teach times tables and uh, that you should listen to your parents and not do drugs, then... I think he would say, yeah, clearly, we. how could we not prefer the latter? You, you're saying that, no, the libertarian should just say, nope, you should just privatize the schools and that's it and let the, you know, let other people dictate what public, what the curricula are. We, you know, it, it wouldn't be, though, to say, well, given that we have schools, yes, the teachers can go and smack kids in the head and, and cause them to bleed because then that's clearly a violation. But 
it's not that you have a right to be taught in, you know, taught Satanism at school. So if the libertarian re- says, no, I don't want public school teachers teaching that, it's violating somebody's rights. So I think that's the way he would try to respond to what you just said. Right. But as I said earlier, I think their mismanagement theory is predicated on state claim land being owned by taxpayers. And, and if, I, mm-hmm. if, if, as I contend, it's unowned land, then it's, it's a, it, it, people can freely traverse it or homestead it. Uh, and then secondly, there, there are new violations of rights. They're violating the rights of citizens to interact with, with immigrants. So I don't, I don't see how it can be a libertarian position to advocate for, for en- enhanced government power. Uh, I think we should be arguing for the abolition of it. And then, you know, there are other actions libertarians can take to really get at the source of the wrong. But I think mistaking the immigrant as the wrong is, in my view, um, not, not the right position for libertarians to take. Um, okay. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead? And, no, yeah. So like, yeah. I, cause I could push back, but here I know all this stuff is going to come up as we yeah. keep going through this. So go, if you want to go ahead with your well, the other an, an, another assumption is another thing that I think is odd for libertarians to um, talk about is by distinguishing between a citizen and an immigrant, you're basically giving credence to the state's designation of your status. Right? One one person has the right state papers, the other doesn't. And if you look at you know citizens and immigrants, there's no moral distinction between a citizen and immigrant, and there's no economic distinction. The only distinction is a political arbitrary distinction. And, it, it, you know, citizens commit crimes, citizens, um, you know, go on welfare, citizens, um, you know, strain the hospital and government education system. So citizens do everything that, that the immigrants are, you know, that these libertarians are claiming immigrants do. And so the only distinction they're making is because the governments put, put some people in one bucket and some people in another that they should be treated differently. And I, again, I think that's that's not a uh, a healthy position for libertarians to acknowledge that the state can, des- can designate your status. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there too, I, I, I'm very sympathetic to that one, Simon. Um, I suppose they could say something like, uh, somebody who, like, a because I've seen this, uh, Chris Freeman, actually, I hope I'm saying his last name right. Um, he and Dave debated this on, with, it was Liz West, Wolf and, and Zach. His last name starts with a W. I forget what it is. Um, they recently hosted them. To the, in there, yeah, that Chris's position was, I think most libertarians would, would be upset if, you know, you're in Ohio and you're in your car and you're trying to drive into Pennsylvania and the government agents stop you and they want to see your papers and whatever. Like, you'd be outraged. And what is this fascist police state? That it, and so he's saying, so if you get that, well, then why, you know, would you want... People, you know, so I guess there they could argue and say, well, because you probably implicit, if you've been a citizen here for your whole life and you're an adult, probably you funded the interstate highways and da, da, da. But yeah, so you could come up with that. But I think he's right that most people, they, it's not that they would be going through all that in their mind. I think their just initial reaction would be, are you kidding me? You're not letting me go from one state to another. That's crazy. That's fascism. Right. Um, okay. A, th- a third um sort of point I would make is that the one of the defining elements of libertarianism is that we assess justice at the individual level. We we believe that only individuals have rights and only individuals commit wrongs, uh, not groups. And you know the, the a lot of a lot of these libertarians will say, you know, the, the immigrants, you know, they're they're, they're they're criminals, they're welfare bums, etc. Um, and maybe there are derivations of that. Maybe they're saying, you know, a lot of them are. But but I think we wouldn't do that in any other context as libertarians. I mean, just to pick an arbitrary example, if if a balding economist killed somebody, we wouldn't say all balding economists are killers. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if a redhead um, stole something, we wouldn't say all redheads are, are thieves. So I think, you know, You've got to, uh, to, to, to tar all, to, to set an immigration policy because you've tarred all immigrants as criminals or welfare bums or whatever, I think is unlibertarian because we, we believe in assessing justice at the individual level. And in fact, it almost seems like that Tom Cruise movie, Minority Report, where they have the pre crime unit, you know, where they predict who's going to commit mm. crime and they go interdict them before they commit the crime. So in, in my contention, 
immigrants are not committing a crime by um, traversing public, you know, state claim land. Uh, and, and so in that context, um, you know, to, to bar them from doing so, I think is it, just because they might be a criminal or they might be a welfare bum, I think is, is a problem there. Cause again, you're assessing justice at the group level, not the individual level. <clears throat> Okay, yeah, I think that's a valid point, and especially, so you're right, Simon, I think a lot of the arguments that you'll see, especially like on Twitter or something, that are anti-open borders will make arguments like you're saying, and strictly speaking, yeah, you could use the same thing to say, well, the state should come in and sterilize, you know, certain types of women, because clearly, statistically, if they keep popping out kids, you know, they're going to grow up to be criminal, you know, and that clearly is unlibertarian. Uh Having said that, though, I I don't think Dave's position is is that. So he he is, and we'll, we'll return to this obviously as I'll let you go through your points. But I think the fundamental clash he's going to have with you, Simon, is to say, right? I it's not. I'm saying keep them out because statistically they might commit crimes. I'm saying they do not have the right to just walk into land where they're not invited. That, that you don't have the right to do that. That's not aggression to prevent somebody from walking into land. And I know, so I think ultimately the disagreement is going to be over this issue of the land that the government claims to, to own, what's its status vis-a-vis -vis libertarian theory. And that's why mm -hmm. I, I think your paper was great and why I wanted you to come here. Because to me, that seems like the central question here yes. among Rothbardian types who are arguing about this. Right. And, and, and then, um, so a fourth point, that I would say it's odd for libertarians to take is it seems like the stance is that the ends justify the means. And let me unpack that. Um, you know, it seems like the, these libertarians would say, well, you know, what would the country come to or look like if we just, if we just had so-called open borders? Um, and, you know, can you show me how, you know, we could survive or, it's, or how, the, you know, the country wouldn't deteriorate or et cetera, et cetera. And, and I'm not, by the way, I'm not attributing any of these specifically to Dave. Uh, these mm -hmm. are discussions I've had with, with all of the libertarians who are for state management of borders while there's a state. There's got to be a, a better way to say that. Um, so um, it's, to me, it's a bit like, you know, if you were arguing with a slave owner in antebellum US and, and saying, you know, slavery is immoral, we need to end it. And the slave owner says, well, who would pick the cotton or how would blacks integrate into society? Or, you know, if you were talking about drug decriminalization, someone said, well, can you tell me, show me how we're not going to have a drugged out zombie community, mm -hmm. but you know, the wrong is throwing people in cages for possessing or, or trading a substance the government uh, disapproves of. And then you gave an example, I think, in your re recent talk at OSU about if, if the Soviet government had consulted you about, you know, privatizing grocery stores and, and uh, you know, you would rightly say, you know, they'd say, well, where will the grocery stores be? And you would rightly say, I don't know, that's for the market process to work out. Mm -hmm. And so the implication being that then they'd say, well, then, you know, we're not privatizing until we know what it looks like. Mm -hmm. and, and so all of these situations are where people are saying, unless you can give me a satisfactory end state, then I want the status quo to continue. Um, and, and the problem with that is that is the ends justifying the means. And libertarianism is all about means. Libertarianism is never about ends. It's about mm -hmm. the proper use of force. So, you know, for, for these types of libertarians to, to say that, that we need the state to do this unless you can show me that there'll be a satisfactory end state without the state, I think, again, is, is overlooking the wrong and, and using ends to justify the means. Okay, again, totally fair point, and I agree with you insofar as it goes, and, and just broken record at this point, I know Dave's position on this is to say, right, I agree, Simon, if, if this were an illegitimate use of force, but he, he's saying, I don't think it's violating anybody's rights to keep out uninvited trespassers, and hence he's saying what would really be dumb is if libertarians go around chanting open borders when the public thinks that's crazy, and so we, you know, we just look like idiots and we advocate things that in practice would be devastating, Dave would claim. And it's not even in defense of principle. Like, yes, if it's, you know, you, you put a gun to my head and say, should we legalize heroin? Yes, even though a lot of people think that's nuts. 
but and that's the libertarian position. But Dave's point is he doesn't think open borders is is obviously the libertarian position. So why are we falling on this sword that we don't have to fall on? That's what he would would say. Yeah, no, and, and obviously it's the same point recurring. But the, the only yeah. new new point I would raise is let's not forget that the immigration police state also violates the rights of citizens. Right, mm. the citizens are free to um, to interact with whom they want, and so even if Dave were to say that. Uh, immigrants don't have the right to traverse the border. Um, it, it's not a case that that means there's no that that that, that that's the only right that um, needs to be protected. You know that, that that's the only violation. There's a a violation by the state of of the rights of citizens to interact with immigrants. So there's always that violation going on, regardless of your stance on immigrants. Okay, so. Rather than me trying to argue here, let's defer because I at the end, you know, in the lightning round, when I bring up okay. these, a lot of my stuff's going to come. Okay. So go, go ahead if you, because I think you still got more you want to say. Yeah. So just the the last point on the on this um, second bucket is the, the other aspect I think that is unlibertarian to argue is it, 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 it's pretty odd. It's it's depending on the state to make effective policy and implement it because. Think of think of what that's saying. Um, first of all, it ignores public choice theory. Um, you know, libertarians have been railing for years about, at best, the incompetence, if not the evil corruption and evil and corruption of uh, individuals at the state. You know, I mean, Hopper has said that the nature of democracy is that the worst demagogues rise to the top. Um, you know, that these these people are not subject not subject to market discipline. But what these libertarians are saying is. That's true, except in the case of immigration, we'll go with that. And, um, you know, for now, while we have a state. So I think that's odd. Yeah. Another odd point is that you often hear them say no one wants open borders. And, um, mm. and that, that has a number of shortcomings, I think. First of all, I'm not sure it's true. I think there's probably a fair number of Americans who are comfortable with the current policy and maybe would want a more liberal policy. So it's not the case that no one wants open borders. Um, but it's not enough to say no one wants open borders because you need to come up with a specific policy that you want the state to implement. And um, I think these libertarians assume they'll get the policy they want. But, um, you know, you think about as, as, you know, per Austrian economics, preferences are subjective. And if you have 240 million adults in the U.S., you could have 240 million different preferences on an immigration policy. And mm -hmm. to say the state should manage that means, first of all, you're, you're assuming the state can know what those preferences are and that they can reconcile them into a single policy, that elected representatives will be faithful servants. And, and I think Kinsella says that we should go by the majority view, but, you know, it's long been a libertarian principle that, that major the majority's um, opinion isn't... Uh, it's not legitimate to bind a dissenting minority. So there's a lot of aspects of, of what libertarians are used to saying about the state and its shortcomings that seem to be pushed aside in the area of immigration. It's a bit like conservatives saying the state is incompetent at home, we've got to reform it. But once they go abroad and go, you know, invade other countries, yeah, we've got the best military in the world and they're efficient, they can get the job done. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's a bit of a, an inconsistency there. Um, and then I'd just like to, under this bucket. Yeah, let me. So, is that the end of your sub point on that one? Yeah, yes. Okay, yeah, let me just respond to that, Simon. So, to me, that's, I think, one of the strongest objections I had. And why I personally, again, folks, I'm not, I promise I'm not just trying to be coy. It's, I, I do want to facilitate. And, and this is what I was, when I had Dave on, Simon, that's kind of the point that I made. And since he didn't seem like he had a problem with it, that's, that's why it ended up looking like I was just agreeing with him, but it was more that my one major problem, he was fine with it. Whereas I was kind of saying, me personally, it doesn't matter what I say, it's not going to affect government policy. So why don't I just mostly focus on, let's imagine what an ANCAP society would look like. Like, I think that's the most good I can do, or also now facilitating this debate and trying to clarify and make sure we're not straw manning each other. So that's why I'm taking the role I am. Because yeah, it's, it is a bit weird, Simon, I agree with you that the more extreme people on this issue are saying, oh, it's not just that they're busing in immigrants to vote Biden in. They're like equipping, uh, you know, an army of, that who are going to crack down on, you know, American white heterosexual Christians five years from now. 
and and by the way, I'm not saying that like, oh, that's so stupid. I mean, if you want to make that argument, there's you can point to a lot of data. <laughs> so I'm saying, so it's a bit weird to say, so to stop that, why don't we just get enough libertarians to finally say, close the borders, and then Biden's going to do what the right thing, you know, like that's kind of like, no, if that's who we're up against, you know, I, that that's why I personally am talking about secession and things. Because to me, it seems right. like if that's where we are, trying to get the right people to go to Washington or make our voices heard and they're going to finally do what the people want. That seems kind of like a losing strategy if, if things are that bad. So I, I think I'm kind of agreeing with you on this 0.5 of bucket two. <laughs> well, I got, I got, I got just a, a, a couple more, two more under this um, last, last 0.5 of bucket two. Um, so Hopper in his writings has a very specific solution that I think a lot of people latch on to. It's this invitor concept, invitor guarantee, mm -hmm. that the only way an immigrant can come in is if the invitor, I guess that's an employer or a landlord or somebody, guarantees all the living costs of this um, immigrant and also guarantees he, he will peacefully act. You know, he won't uh, commit any violent crimes. And I, I understand where Hopper's coming from, but this then... This comes back to he's not saying we should apply that to citizens, right? So um, an employer of a domestic citizen isn't being asked to guarantee all that. A, a landlord to a domestic citizen tenant's not being asked to guarantee all that. It's actually like it's it's sort of like protectionism for for domestic uh, tenants and labour because you're imposing like a tariff on on um, imported labour and imported tenants, and the only way to argue that that's valid is if you, uh, again, going back to an earlier point, if you give credence to the state's designation of individuals as either an immigrant or a citizen. So I, you know, I, I, that, that I have a problem with that particular invitor guarantee concept as well. Okay. Yeah. And here again, so, well, I think in terms of the economics, the, dis the distinction Hoppe makes in one of his earlier papers on this, um, He's trying to explain why he is still for free trade, but no longer, or I don't mm -hmm. know if he ever was, but is not in favor of unrestricted immigration because a lot of free market types think it's the same thing. Like, well, gee, if you, if it makes – and you kind of – what you're getting there, Simon, like it, if you understand why protectionism against – you know, for, for domestic auto car makers is, is bad, why would you want it for domestic workers? Like, isn't there a sense in which, you know, they're getting privileges that the, the worker in Mexico is not getting? If a domestic U.S. workers can go around to anywhere they want and supply their services, but the Mexican guy, you know, no, all of a sudden the employer has to not only pay the wages, but also be on the hook for all kinds of stuff that the guy's going to do. Whereas if you hire an American worker, that's not the case. So I, I get that. But, and I guess Hoppe's point is to say, well, the difference though is that when you, it, it's not that cars or Chinese TVs or sweaters just on their own volition enter the United States. There's always an importer bringing them in. So there's clearly a voluntary trade. Uh, it's not as obvious. And so if somebody comes into the country, especially if it's you know an illegal immigrant, the fact that some guy pays him some money to you know pick fruit or whatever or clean you know clean the uh, the the rooms in a hotel or something and, and you know they're volunteer they're they're employed but they're imposing costs on other people or damages that you know the employer they're not fully compensating it for so uh, he, he so i get i get what your your point is but i guess it ties back to just to go on a quick tangent when, and once uh i wrote a novel where i imagined there was this island that was totally ANCAP and i just went through the paces of what would happen and I thought what would partly what would happen is governments around the world would take their convicts, like serial killers and whatever, political prisoners, and just get rid of them. And instead of keeping them in their own countries, would just drop them off on the shores of this ANCAP island and be like, here, you deal. And so I thought, what would happen? And, they, and I thought, well, the property owners wouldn't want just hordes of people showing up that they had no idea who they were. And so I thought there'd clearly be companies that would bring them in, you know, they'd search them for weapons or whatever. And then you would just very, you know, over time get more and more privileges or, you know, entry into the community at large. And you would have to have like a, a third party vouch for you. 
and then say that, you know, this we agree if this person commits a crime or something, we'll, and that's why all the property owners would be okay with, oh, okay, you got somebody vouching for you. Yeah, you can come into my mall. Because if, I, if you're just some random guy from planet Earth, I don't know who you are, you can't come into my mall because that's crazy, you know. So that's kind of how I pictured it. And so I, I think that's the sense where Hop is coming from that, yes, it's imperfect and everything, but there's a sense in which it's it's not hypocritical or a contradiction to say outsiders coming into the system, you know, there has to be a way to, to limit that flow. Well, but you could object to that in a couple of ways. One is mm-hmm. citizens endanger other citizens. Citizens commit crimes and are welfare bums. So if the idea is to reduce the strain on the system or keep safety to a minimum standard, then you should apply the same thing. There's no, no, as I said, no no moral or economic distinction between a citizen and, and, a, and an immigrant. And secondly, shouldn't you then control birth rates because those are new entrants into the economy? And, and you know, it, it just I think the, the, the implication of saying that, that a subset of humanity um, needs to be guaranteed but the others don't just seems to me, mm-hmm. you know, uh, it undeveloped as a concept. Yeah, I, I like that. Um, you know, I, I think I have. Re- I mean, I, I'm pretty. I'm almost positive that I've seen Hoppe say the idea that if someone can sneak into the country and just have a baby on U.S. soil, that the baby becomes a citizen. That's crazy. I'm, I'm pretty sure I've seen him say that. I don't want to put words into his mouth. But yeah, it's. I agree, Simon. Um, I could see a certain logic with well, given that the citizens are here. It is what it is. Otherwise, the only conclusion would be the state should deport everybody and then, you know, just wide empty U- U.S., and that seems kind of weird. Um, but you're right, like, the about new people coming into the state via people's birth canals as opposed to external immigration. I I, I have not seen anybody even grapple with that. And so I, I agree with you. That's, that's something that's not clear to me how they would even attempt to address that. Right. And then just quickly, one last point in this bucket. So... The, 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 these libertarians would say that the state should manage this public property as a private owner would, but the only question they ever ask is who shall enter the property. But a private owner also cares about what use the property is put to. And so why shouldn't the state therefore decide what use to put land to? And are that, is that what libertarians are saying, that a private owner, if he had a vacant land near the border, might decide to build uh, houses and roads and stores and, and schools because he wants to maximize the value of the land. But so why why sh- why then shouldn't the state do that? And it's just again an odd extension of the of the que- of the concept of the state managing property as a private owner would. Who enters is not the only decision a private owner makes. Okay, maybe this is the time to deal with Dave's school analogy or example that you know, wouldn't Dave say, well, I don't know what you mean, Simon, that, you know, clearly like my workhorse example of the public, the local public school, where to me, it seems pretty obvious that the, you know, heroin addict does not have some libertarian right to walk into the school and sit down in the third grade classroom and shoot up while the kids are staring at him that that can keep him out. But I think he would go further than that and say, and also to go back to my earlier example that, yeah, if, if if it's up for referendum, that, should the local public school be teaching times tables and phonics or should it be teaching the proper way to worship Satan and why, uh, you know, white people are evil? What do you think? I, I think Dave would have a strong opinion on that and he would, you know, say it's not unlibertarian to vote for one or the other. You, you don't nearly merely need to say, no, there shouldn't be public schools, period. And I don't even know why we're talking about curricula. So I think he's, his position. So are you just saying, but anyway, I think that's what he would say. So now if you want to like push well, back on that. I, I guess my, I, I think my point was a little different. Maybe I misunderstood what you said, that that these libertarians assume that the only question that needs to be asked is who enters this public land. But if, if the idea is to mimic a private owner, then the state needs to mimic what the private owner would do with that land. So it would need to develop the land. And, and it just seems odd to be... Um, you know, putting forward an argument, the the end point of which is that the state should, you know, erect buildings and build roads, and that I mean, how, aren't we against that? So I, I don't know. It's just it's just like an incomplete uh, discussion about how a private owner would manage property. It's not just a question of who comes onto the property. Okay, so, okay. So what I was trying to do, so you understood why I, I respond the way I did, Sam, was to say I don't think Dave 
is shying away from talking about more than just who's allowed to enter. Like in the school example, I think he has said explicitly um, in, other, in other places I've seen him arguing on Twitter saying that kind of stuff. Like, if, like should the schools teach Marxism versus free market economics? Like should libertarians care? And he said, yeah, of course they, they should say something. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but your point, Simon, if I get it, is you're saying, it's, why stop at just saying, oh, well, given that we have border checkpoints set up, let's have the... Um, the the people at the border checking to to you know limit the the influx of immigrants. Why don't they put a, a a bank there? Why don't they put a shopping mall there that's owned by the government and run on behalf of the taxpayers and it'll lower the deficit? Right. Yeah, very know, very few private owners would let land hmm. stay vacant. They they put it to okay. use to maximize value. And then you know the the calling card hmm. is yeah, we've got to ma- to manage the property like a private owner would. So, right. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um. All right, so then I just had two other points um, that are sort of dealing with some of the justifications that these libertarians give. We we already dealt with one of them. uh, I had three points. We dealt with one of them. That's the second best. Um, So you often hear um, one justification for this position is that these immigrants coming in are going to, you know, damage the culture, destroy the American identity, or I forget whatever Mm -hmm. phrases people use. And I guess I would have a couple of responses to that. First of all, as a historical matter, I'm not sure there ever has been an American culture or an identity. If you look at the way the country was settled, it was a whole bunch of separate societies developed as colonies, and these people came from different parts of Britain or Europe. They had different religions, traditions, governance practices. The fact that the colonies cooperated in a limited extent to get out, kick out the British doesn't mean that there was one culture. There's always been a whole series of separate societies in the U.S. It's the nature of sort of the federalist system. Um, And then secondly, I feel like this song has been sung before on many occasions, you know, people saying that these immigrants are taking jobs or um, strains on the system, damaging the culture. I mean, think back again to the antebellum US. Uh, Blacks were not popular. I mean, that's when the word racist actually meant something uh, or or, or, had had real meaning. I mean, even in the the North, there were black codes, states uh, that, uh, that... Blacks couldn't enter the state or vote or own property. So, you know, people didn't want blacks to integrate society. They thought they would be an issue. Uh, They would, you know, ruin the culture and, and, and take jobs and things like that. Look at in the earlier 20th century, Irish Catholics, Italians, Jews, Poles, you know, the same arguments against those immigrants are the ones you're hearing now against today's Mm. immigrants. So, and then when I look at what has it, you know, I understand where these libertarians are coming from. I think they're on what I would call the cultural right. We're, and mm. I'm on the cultural right too. And I define that as people who have a respect for tradition, who believe in pushing governance down to the lowest level possible and who are comfortable with human differences. Uh, and, and so I understand that people look at the US today and say, well, those things aren't there or, or they're being attacked. But, but you look at who did that. I think it's uh, it's mostly white European Americans on the cultural left who have been responsible for that. I mean, the worst, most tyrannical presidents who enlarged the central government and set up the national security and welfare states, um, you know, Wilson, Lincoln, Wilson, FDR, LBJ, I think they were the product of voting and policy preferences of, uh, for the most part, of, of white European Americans on the cultural left. So I think it's convenient to blame immigrants for what's gone on, but I, I think it misses the mark that that this has always been a, a, a song that people sing about today's disfavoured immigrants. And, mm-hmm. second, and secondly, I think the, the rot set in years ago, well before the current batch of immigrants. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if we could just stop those white men from becoming U.S. president, <laughs> exactly. record might be better, right? right. Um, well, let me just ask, so are you... Let me put it this way, because I, I think unfortunately this debate often just ends up in the context of the United States, and uh, and then you know the the implication is so clearly anyone who wants to who wants the U.S. government to enforce its border controls, it's because they're racist. But like like let's take Japan, I believe Dave would be fine. You know, the, I think my understanding is the Japanese government you know has a relatively compared to other countries you know restrictive. Immigration policy, and also like I've, I haven't been there yet, but I very much want to go visit Japan, and I 
kind of want there to be mostly Japanese people when I get there to feel like I'm in a foreign exotic land. And if I got over there and it was a bunch of guys who looked like me and there was just a bunch of McDonald's, I would be kind of disappointed. And so are you are just making a particular case about the United States and the melting pot? Or are you saying even around the world, you don't think it's valid for people to kind of like their the way their country is right now and be a little bit sad if it rapidly changed over the next 20 years? Well, uh, I'm saying the state muddies everything, right? Um, but but ultimately what you're talking about is the ends justifying the means, that you want an mm-hmm. end state of society and you'll use violence to get there. I mean, in my context, um, you know, I'm thinking that the immigration police state is is a violent institution. So, right. so um, it, that you get back to, to the ends just to justify the means, which I, I mm-hmm. as I've said, I don't, I don't agree with. Um, but, you, you know, the, the, so I think, you know, libertarians should be attacking the problem, which is the state, the welfare system, the um, you know, the school and hospital regulations, the minimum wage, occupational licensing, the war on drugs, war on terrorism. All these things are what create the problems in society. It's and so uh, it's the state that's the that should be the focus of libertarians' advocacy and efforts, not not um, you know in, in individuals who uh, who have, mm. you know who come from somewhere different than, than where, where they are. So I, I'm not saying I, I, people are, I mean, everyone wants to live in a society that they picture as being like them probably. I mean, I, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people. But it's a question of how you get there. Do you get there through violence or do you get there through other means? Um, okay. Um, and then just the last point that you often hear these libertarians justify, they say, yes, we, we, don't, we don't want the state um, but, you know, we can only get rid of border controls once we've gotten rid of the welfare system. Uh, I sort of call that sequence libertarianism. Um, and, you know, there's a precise sequence in which things have to unfold to get to where we want. But that, that reeks of state self-justification or one wrong justifying another. I mean, if the wrong the state's committing is setting up the welfare system, and then you say, oh, yeah, because we have the welfare system, now we need the state to stop people coming in and living off the welfare system. You know, you, it's sort of self-justifying uh, or, or one wrong justifying another. Um, and, and again, you know, citizens are strains on the welfare system too. I think Rothbard in For a New Liberty, when he was talking about destatization, said that we should never rely on the state to, to get to where we want, we should hack away at every manifestation of its power. And, and again, I'm not trying to argue from authority, but I'm saying that there, you know, I think it's a, it's a cogent point that um, we, we should, libertarians should everywhere and anywhere attack aspects of the state and don't set out a plan that, by the way, is never going to unfold in, in the order you want. And it's not like the state couldn't have scripted mm-hmm. this better, you know, pay no attention to the problems we've created on the welfare system or the hospital or school system, you know, it's the immigrants. Um, so anyway, that's, I, I think I have a problem with what I call sequence libertarianism too. Okay. Just on that point. So I, I get the broad point you're making there, Sam, and just a little bit of a pushback on that one, one, before we get to the fun lightning round, stay, hang in there, folks. Don't turn on, don't turn the dial. The lightning round is going to be fun. But, um, on that, w- what if somebody said something like, um, Hey, I'm a libertarian, and I don't think there should be prison. Certainly not for you know nonviolent drug offenses. And I also don't think there should be food stamps. You know, the government shouldn't be giving food to people. Leave that to private charity, cut taxes, and what. And then somebody says, "So okay, so I think what the government should do clearly is there's a bunch of people in prison right now for nonviolent drug offenses, and the government should stop feeding them. They're still locked in cages, but the government should cut the you know we should cut the funding." to the cafeterias of the prisons and just let those people not get food. And, you know, and you could imagine someone saying, whoa, 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 I agree. The government shouldn't give food to people and there's the people shouldn't be in prison for nonviolent drug offenses, but we should do it in the right order. Let the people out of prison first and then stop giving them food. Don't keep them locked up and cut off the food because then you're starving them to death. Is, but isn't, so, that, isn't that compounding violation upon violation? I mean, what, would the state let charities send food into the prison or would the state prevent charities from doing that? Uh, could, you know, I think there are ways around that, but, um, you know, one one violation of putting someone in a cage doesn't, you know, to, to then say you should also stop them from, from eating 
it, it seems to me that that you're just compounding the the violations. You're not. It's not. You're not really doing any good there. Well, well right. But I mean, I get what you're saying, and I, and and I don't want to push this too far. But I'm just I'm being a bit tongue in cheek. But strictly speaking, I could push it again and say, well, no, because these, these really are analogous. Maybe not in the impact, but in terms of the, the argument that they're saying, no, if we you want. Yes, we all agree complete privatization would be the goal, but we're, what we're saying, the closed border libertarians would say, or the non-open libertarian <laughs> borders, um, would, is we got to get rid of the welfare state because if we just open the floodgates and let 3 million people a day come in, that's going to increase the initiated aggression against the taxpayers who are funding the schools and da 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 da, da. And so... It's yeah, you you maybe are reducing the rights violations of domestic employers and things like that who want to hire some of these immigrants that right now can't come in, but you're increasing the rights violations of these people over here. Just like if the state stopped feeding prisoners, it would reduce the rights violations of the people who are funding it, even though it would increase the violations of the people sitting in jail. So anyway, that that's the the point I'm making. That right. the sequence in that particular example that I gave is clearly pretty important. Whereas earlier you were kind of making a blanket statement. No, if something makes sense, do it. And don't worry about the interaction it has with other pre-existing government interventions. Any intervention that we can end, end it right now. I don't care about what the other ones are. That's, you know, so. Ma 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 yeah, ma maybe maybe it comes down to what you just you say is the, the state policy that should end. I mean, they should let these people out of, <laughs> out of prison. Uh -huh. um, that, that would be the 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 libertarian call not not to stop feeding yeah, them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So are is that the the main points you wanted to make? Yeah, I mean, there's an Austrian economics point that um, you know, Julian Simon noted that humans are the ultimate resource. And so it seems like more more potential workers uh increases, you know, prosperity because it increases production in the economy and and we should all want that. Um and and again, to say that immigrants are lazy bums, I think is is tar you know towering a whole class um, of people mm. without without basis. So I you know, but but I think the argument is, I guess. So my, just to sum up, my my main point is that these these libertarians claim that the libertarian position is state management of borders while that while there's a state, and I don't think that is the libertarian position. I think as I've laid out, I think that that's not the libertarian position. But then the whole management of the property, um, I think it's not even a productive libertarian strategy because so much of the arguments, as I've outlined, I think goes against general libertarian principles. And, and you know, you push back rightly on some of them, so I'm not, not disputing that. But anyway, that's that's about all I Okay, think. that's good. So I could sit here and get into the weeds with you, on the, but I think it'll be more fun. Let me illustrate what I think might be some of the potential problems with your framework by giving mm -hmm. you some examples. Some are more serious, some are more just intended to be funny. But, okay, so I'm just going to run through here. I've got s several, like about five or six examples of, I just want to get your, so let, if you can, Simon, try to keep your answers on the short side because we've got like six of these to get through. And, and your answer may be the same flavor for four of these. Okay. okay um, let's say there is a church that the, lo you know, a church building, the local government wants to build a road they use eminent domain to seize the church. The, the congregation, the pastor, they're outraged. The community is a little bit alarmed and they file and they get an injunction. And so it's held up in the courts, right? The, 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 the church community is saying, no, this is our property. You can't build a road. The city government saying, yes, we can, eminent domain. And we, you know, we're going to compensate you. We compensate them. And they're arguing, so the judge, you know, it's, it's held up in court. But right now, legally speaking, according to the, you know, status court system, the local city government is the owner and imagine that there's a bunch of Satanists who are squatting inside the church at night doing all kinds of sadistic rituals and things. And the church leaders go to the government and say, ultimately, we want you to give that back to us. But in the interim, can you at least put some cops on the doors to keep these Satanists from desecrating our, our property? And is it your position that no, technically it's unowned and it would be a further, you know, not only did they steal from the church people, but it would be violating the rights of the Satanists to not let them go in to that area that, you know, now unowned virgin property and homestead it with their rituals. 
I would regard that as a case of state seized land. So there mm-hmm. was a prior legitimate owner. And, and so I would say that if you were going to have the state managing property on behalf of, you know, the, this is, again, where the literature falls short, that no one talks about in state seized land, the state should really consult the prior owner. So, Okay, so you're fine. The, to you, that wouldn't be two wrongs. That would no. be the one no. wrong was seizing the church's property and then, yeah, given that the state's going to manage it, it's okay to ask the church leader, how do you want us to manage this property? Yes. Okay. Uh, what about... Yeah, I, I, in the context of, of yes, there being a state, and, and that's that's what you're stuck with. For yeah, libertarian yeah. Libertarian obviously. Libertarian the, libertarian. The, the best solution is that the government says, oh, my gosh, we read Rothbard. We're so sorry. Yeah. Take your church back, obviously. But we're yeah. saying, you say they're not going to do that. Would it, you know... Is it okay for a libertarian to say, I think the government should put some cops, I mean, ideally they would be volunteer police who aren't using tax dollars to fund their, but to, to keep, and again, not shooting the Satanists in the head, but just saying, you guys can't, you can't come in here. Sorry, you keep walking. Right, it's, okay. it's recognizing the prior legitimate ownership. Okay, yeah. what about, um, and this is, you know, this is real. There's uh, lately, well, it was a couple months ago, there were a lot of protests, I think it was like climate stuff, but just in general, uh, protesters just blocking roads. You know, people are trying to go to work and 15, whatever, uh, climate change activists just hold arms and stop traffic. And a bunch of people are, does, does the libertarian have to say, no, I mean, there, no one really owns that road. And the protester, they kind of homesteaded that. And it's their, you know, these people, the, you know, it's not that the guy in his car has any more right to use that road, that intersection than the protesters do. So, Libertarians really should just butt out of this. Uh, so first of all, if, if it were state claimed land as opposed to state seized land, then I would say that um, it, you know the correct characterization is it is unowned. But then the question is, well, has actually someone homesteaded it, or are they just you know on it? Because you can you can you can be on a piece of unowned land without the intention or the or the actions to actually homestead it, but. I would argue the, that the protesters probably have the same right as the drivers to be on unowned land, unless you're going to say that one or either of them have homesteaded. You could say, you could say that the drivers have been driving the same route to the office, you know, every day for the last year that they've in fact homesteaded an easement uh, on that unowned land. So you could make that argument. Whereas the protesters just got there, they're the Johnny Come Lately, so they probably wouldn't have the same rights. I mean, that that's the type of arguments I would. I okay, would, uh, right. so just to connect that then to the immigrant, so I mean, you see where I'm going with this, right? That if you agree, even U.S. born citizens who live in that city can't just go block an intersection, or at least you agree it's plausible to say that they don't have the right to do that under libertarian theory. How can people who are for the first time stepping foot onto that intersection, how, how do they have the untrammeled right? to be there if the local native-born people don't? Well, I didn't say the local native-born people didn't have the right to be there. I said, I, I, I mean, I'm not sure I understand your question. As I said, the, the locals who drive that route every day, you could argue homesteaded an easement to drive that route. Mm-hmm. They might not have homesteaded the whole property, but they've certainly gotten an easement uh, right of way. So if, if, they, if they were doing that first, then late latecomers who try to interfere with the exercise of the rights of that easement would be in the wrong. Okay, so what I'm where I'm pushing this, Simon, and, and my examples are going to get more and more ridiculous as we go through this. Just to warn you, um, okay. I'm trying to show how. To me, it seems obvious. Like you, you, the legal status of it's not just a, a you know certain the, the the literal border between the U.S. and Mexico, but the idea of all the government, you know, the sidewalks and the building or the the roads and so forth throughout the country, that it's not that, that all those arteries and whatever are just completely unowned, right? That surely U.S. residents have more of a claim over how that property should be used or managed on their behalf by the government, since technically the government says, no, we own those sidewalks and the roads, rather than somebody in South America who's never even set foot in the country. Yeah, no, I see, I, I see your point. And I guess you have to look at each parcel of land and ask, have have people, if you assume that it, it, it 
it's not owned by the state, and, and I would contend not owned by the taxpayers, mm -hmm. open for homesteading. Has Have locals homesteaded that land or, or have they created an easement? So, and that, that immigrants, and not just immigrants, citizens who haven't also created that easement cannot interfere with the exercise of rights. So again, I don't distinguish between immigrants and citizens. It's a question of who has, who has homesteaded that easement, uh, if anyone has at all. And no one can interfere in that. And in, in, in any case, um, advocating for the state to manage that, I think, is, again, I, I believe, I'm libertarian. Okay. I got just four more, and I'll go fast them. And again, folks here, with the, I'm just going to say them and then let Simon give his response, and we're going to move. I'm not going to keep pressing him because I didn't do that with Dave, so it wouldn't be fair, right? I just I want to raise these issues so everyone can know where Dave, you know, how he handled the, the tough, I, I think I asked him one hardball question. I'm asking you more, partly like I said, Simon, because I had more time to get ready for this one. Okay, the International Space Station, right? It's mm -hmm. in orbit around the Earth. I'm pretty sure lots of stolen taxpayer dollars were used from various countries to fund that thing. If Martians showed up and, and you know physically took possession of it, did they do anything wrong to Earthlings? Or did they just homestead this unowned thing that was orbiting the planet. So let's go back to the discussion we had earlier about can the state legitimately own property. Mm -hmm. So if the state, if, if if the materials used to construct the space station were voluntarily transferred by private owners to the state, or if private owners constructed the space station and then voluntarily transferred it to the state, then I think in that case the state would own uh, that space station. Um, but as I said, it's temporary. The taxpayers could go against it and seize it. But while the state owns it, if the Martians come and and uh, if they want to you know, use force to seize it, I would say they're, they're, it's weird to say this, but they're interfering in the state's legitimate ownership. Okay. Like I said, folks, I'm not going to push them. I'm just going to keep moving on and then I'll let you decide. You can ponder these things. Okay. Recently, there were protesters who broke into the Louvre and threw soup on the Mona Lisa. Like, it was protected, but, you know, they threw it. I went and looked. My understanding is the Mona Lisa was originally owned by the, you know, French royal court or something, and then after the revolution in 1789, the people owned it. So I think in our framework, you know, it's not Pierre Von Sorin owns it. Like, it's, you know, government property. So did those protesters mix their soup with the unowned artwork and make it their own? Do those protesters now own the Mona Lisa? Well, uh, two, two responses. One is I'm not, I'm not clear on how the, the state came to own that painting. Did they seize it off a private owner or did the private owner abandon it and so it was open to homesteading? And I don't think the state can homestead it. So okay. I'm just, pretty sure the owner of the Mona Lisa didn't abandon it. I don't know exactly okay. what happened. But. Right. So, so, so it states it states seized mm -hmm. property, so it belongs to the prior owner. Um, but the, the second point, more importantly, is I don't think throwing paint on a painting is evidence of homesteading. I mean, the, the whole notion of mixing your labor with the land, I think that that Locke espoused, I think has been is not. I I, I, I lean towards Hopper's. Um, uh, approach that the way to homestead is to objectively indicate to the world that you're the uh, you have the most direct link to control the property and so you know if you drive by unowned land and you throw a coke can on there as garbage it's not evidence of homesteading i don't think you've taken the right actions to homestead it you need to go and build a fence around it and claim it so merely throwing paint on the mona lisa i wouldn't say is an act of homesteading okay so like what about environmentalists who uh, chain themselves to like old redwood trees? Do they own, if it's in a public forest? Uh, that's a good question. That's a good question. That's probably an edge case. Are they, are they intending to claim ownership? I mean, when they unchain themselves, do they go away and leave the tree alone and never come back? You know, so um, you, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. It depends on the facts and circumstances, but I agree that's an edge case. Like, have they done sufficient actions to homestead it? Okay. What's interesting on these is you're, to your credit, like you're, you're kind of biting the bullet. Like I, to me, I think the people who like Dave 
are going to think they can't believe that the, your, your answers aren't obvious and you're just trying to wait. But no, you're kind of like, well, may, maybe. <laughs> so, okay, you're being consistent. I got two more, folks. Okay, next one. This is, this is a fun one. There's a movie. I didn't actually see the movie, so maybe I'm going to botch the plot. But my understanding is there's a Nicolas Cage movie where he goes to steal the U.S. Constitution. Yes. Now, this national, is clearly national, national treasure. Yeah, I think. a status yeah. thing that, you know, overthrew the Articles of Confederation. So if there's ever a wicked status document. So in general, again, I don't know the plot. If some private person breaks into the, where is it, the Smithsonian, steals the U.S. Constitution, and le did he just liberate it? And we should, Americans should applaud, American libertarians should applaud the liberation of the U.S. Constitution if someone were to break into, again, I don't know if this is it the Smithsonian, wherever they keep that thing. And, and, and gives it to some private collector in Dubai, and he keeps it quiet because he doesn't want to get SEAL Team 6 after him, should American libertarians have to publicly applaud that and say, thank goodness somebody homesteaded that thing finally? Well, Walter Block would certainly say, yes, he has the Ragnar principle of the liberator theory mm -hmm. uh, that it's okay to liberate stolen goods from a thief. Uh, but... I, I guess there, there aren't enough facts here because you've got to ask, okay, so the Smithsonian itself or the National Archives, whatever it is, you know, is that is that state claim land or state seize land? So was the person, you know, did the person, um, was it a violation to, to break into there? And then I would ask, ask, argue the same thing about the document itself. Was it, you know, created by private parties and voluntarily transferred to the state uh, um, you know, the materials in it, um, were they, you know, they transferred to the state. I mean, you need to, I, I go back to the same principles I've been espousing all night. I just don't know how you would answer those questions for that. Okay. So just to, for the last, for two of these, just to make sure I'm getting your, I don't want to misrepresent you because I'm sure later, you know, once this episode drops, people are going to be arguing about it. And I want to make sure I understand. Let me just admit, so some private art dealer or, you know, collector and, shake in Dubai or something. He hires his people. They steal the Mona Lisa and they steal the U.S. Constitution and now it's in his private collection when he has parties. He's like, Psst, come here. And he shows people and he's like, you know, keep it keep it under your hat, but, you know, look at this. And the, the French people are outraged. The Americans are outraged. And the correct libertarian response is to tell both of them, you people don't understand property rights. No, we should applaud both of those thefts and, you, you know, you didn't own it. What are you talking about? That was unowned, you know, parchment and, and uh, canvas. And that that's libertarian should go on record telling the outraged French people, no, you guys clearly don't understand libertarianism. That wouldn't be the most weird position libertarians hold. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. But I I'm mean, not... It, we have weirder positions than that. Okay, but, but you're not clearly disavowing that. You're saying, yes, depending on the particulars that is possibly what you would pop out of your framework. Right. Every piece of property is either owned or unowned, mm -hmm. and it's either acquired legitimately or not. And I think you need to ask the same questions every time. Okay. And then last one. In Superman 2, have you seen the movie? Yes. Okay. Time, so yeah. just to refresh people's memory. So there's the three Kryptonians, General Zod, Ursa, and Nam, mm -hmm. that were mm -hmm. sent to the Phantom Zone. And, fled. and Superman takes a – there's a – a nuclear bomb on uh, the Eiffel Tower and Superman in the beginning of the movie and he throws it, releases them. And at one point in the movie, the three crypt, after they've taken, you know, Superman gives up his powers because he's, you know, trying to get friendly with Lois Lane there. And the three Kryptonians are just running roughshod. They take over the world nominally. All the world leaders surrender. And in one of the scenes, they're flying by Mount Rushmore and they use their heat vision and, pss, 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 and they change it from the the... Uh, you know, the, they make it their three faces on Mount Rushmore and they blow up the fourth one. Did they just homestead that? And is that now the property of the Kryptonians? Assuming it was unowned, I would say changing it, irre you know, irrevocably like that would be a pretty good act of homesteading. <laughs> okay. Well, I think that's a good place to end. Uh, Simon, thank you for your time. You were a good sport with this. Um, and I, I guess, do you want to point, so, so people, uh, should know your, your paper is, and we'll, I'll link to it, of course, folks, but if you want to go look at it, it is public property and the libertarian immigration debate, Simon Genzel, uh, it's volume eight, number one, 2016 in the, in the libertarian papers. Um, you know, you can, you can Google that and, and his name is spelled G U E N Z L. So thanks Simon. I think. 
you know, there's going to be a lot of fun reaction to this one. So I appreciate how much time you gave me. I appreciate it. I think our discussion went well beyond my paper, but it was, it was fun. So thank you. Okay. And thank you everyone for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.